on two very different viewpoints. Um, and so the speakers have been prepared. I asked both of them to respond for roughly 10 minutes to you know, their thoughts about what the other person said and what this evokes in their own work or ideas. And so um, I guess we just ended with Rob, so we'll begin with Ben and then end the uh, lecture with, with Rob and open for questions. So. Well, I, I, I thought it was really interesting uh, to hear about all these kind of decisions that you have to make and, and all the challenges that you have. But I, and I thought um, a couple of things that are kind of interesting to me. Uh, the last thing you said, I mean, there was more, but I want to start with the last thing because it's fresh. The whole idea of interactivity, you know, the, the idea. I remember when the, the internet was new for people uh, and Encarta was new for people and people, and people would say, well, now if you, ha if you have a 12-year-old who's studying Jap Japanese culture, he can just go online and, and learn all this stuff because and, and like, that's what 12-year-olds really want to do if they're going online, right, is the first thing they want to do is do their homework. Yeah. Um, you know, and and it's, it's interactive. That's, you know what, books are interactive too. I mean, people, it's like suddenly the, the whole, the, the, you know, interactive as, a, as an adjective became applied to all this, this digital stuff, forgetting the fact that the first kind of like random access technology was the Codex book. I mean, you can open up a, yeah. the book, you can flip it around. I mean, look at the choose your own adventure novels if people know these uh, types of books um, from 30 years ago or whenever. Um, the choose your own adventure novel, you get to the end of a chapter and it'd say, if you want to do this, flip the page, 110. If you want to do this other thing, flip to page, you know, 90. And if you flip to page 90, you died, and then you went back to the original thing to find out where you were supposed to go. And but you know, there's something interactive about obviously interactive. And and children's toys are interactive. I mean, those benches you bang on, or the or the the sheep that you know feels like wool in the book, or all these other things. And you know, I, I I mean. I know you're not saying this, you know, but like obviously computers can do graphic design work, too, or you can do graphic design work on a computer, and you can yeah. do typesetting on a computer. It's not, it's, it's in quotes, all these things mm -hmm. go, sure. typesetting on a computer. Um, but I think there's something really important um, about the continuation of the letterpress. But something I would ask you to talk about, maybe, if you can, is um, you said you shouldn't be in business. And I wondered if um, maybe you're in business because you shouldn't be in business. Um, that is, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, obviously we, we're talking about Helvetica and, and, and that typeface. And it, it, obviously that came about for a reason in the middle of the 20th century. It's futuristic, right? You're going to equate it with cars that have fins and like mm -hmm. the big lights that come out. What is that? You know, that's the space age. You know, we're going to take these cars to other planets and people love the future. Uh, or really people love the futuristic. Um, things that look like the future, but in inevitably will wind up looking like the past. Um, because of the gap, Helvetica doesn't quite look like the past, but someday I hope it does. Um, it looks quaint, uh, perhaps. Um, we'll but in a, in a world where like, it's so easy to do your graphic design on a computer, where you, everybody has access to, at the very least, you know, some online you know, quick, quick, or, or, uh, or Microsoft Word can do basic very basic graphic design work, or you can spend a little bit of money and get a, an Adobe uh, suite or something like that. Is it because it becomes so easy to do that that that's the, that's the, I mean, because this looks hard to me. I mean, when you're talking about, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, so you're, you're saying this is, you know, you, the, the vocabulary is, is, is foreign except for the few things that filter into the computer world. And it almost, and I, it, I, I love this stuff. Um, I was in uh, Knoxville last uh, October at a conference, and there's a print shop there, Yeehaw Industries. And if you're ever in Knoxville, yeah. other than the, 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 the wig sphere, um, if you know that Simpsons episode, um, you should go to Yeehaw Industries. And I was in there like, you could only spend $150. Like, like, you know, like, like, like just like, what am I? Like, I was like overloaded. I called, I called my wife and later. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Um, Cause it's, but it becomes like, for, for geeks, it becomes like a geek, f like, a, like a fetish almost. Um, and I love all the work you're passing around and I love the thought that's gone into it. But like, is it, are you able to survive precisely because you're one of the few people in the world who can actually produce this kind of stuff and thinks about it in this way? No, I'd be, I'd be honest, and I know uh, Brian, Tom, and Ray can attest to this. Um, in 1999, when I first learned about the internet machine, as I call it, I actually saved how many pages were letterpress printers across the country, and I think there were 12 pages then. So what's that, five a page, 10 a page? And I was on the internet to be funny, and I think it's over 180 pages. 
how many letterpress printers there are across the country. So it's, there's a re as I say, it's a renaissance. More people are getting into this, which wonder about the book arts. People are, and I keep saying, we're, we're grasping back. We're stepping backwards, really not forwards. That we all, in every, with every change of every century, there's an arts and crafts movement. And I think it was huge um, in 2000, 2001. Like you mentioned about the, the Cadillac with the fins. Um, all the cars I own are old. I, I love my 67 Mustang because it rattles and creaks like a 67 Mustang convertible should. Um, I do have a new car I do drive, but um, it's, there's something about the um, antiquated stuff. I mean, and we say, why well, say, why well, should not be in business? When I started my business in 1990, I left Rolf after a nine year apprenticeship and I said, I'm going to start a letterpress printer. The four printers in town said, Rob, you won't last a year. I'm still here, like the song says, and they're all gone. And um, uh, this year we're celebrating our 20 year in business. And it's just, um, and I jokingly say, Ben, we're, I shouldn't be in business. And I actually have an article from a printing magazine in 1992 says print is dead. And they were all, I need to frame that or I should have brought it and passed it out tonight. It is amazing. They said we will, where they're predicting the, um, the iPhone books now that we have, we listen on tape. We'll, we're not gonna, we're not gonna print within 10, 12 years. We're printing more than we ever have now um, than we ever have before. And, and as I jokingly, but not jokingly say, with the internet machine, as I call it, we're still beating our wives, we're still beating our kids. Are, are we any better with this technology? You know, so maybe it's kind of, I'm like, I'm a throwback to the past. I like everything old because maybe it takes us back to a time when we were a little bit more innocent as a country or as, or as mankind, you know, and there's things that there are great lessons in our past and, and as a country, um, we're forgetting those things. And, and I'll even talk to young uh, school students. They bring in all the graduating students from different schools and we talk about different things. I mean, even as little as nine, 10 years ago. And they're with the internet, you would think that they would be exposed to this or, or have knowledge of this. And I'm like, where did you come from? Or, you know what I'm saying? And it's just, it scares me, I guess. And the thing about this is, this is um, maybe this is a little bit back when America was really, really great. You know, we still have some of the, the longest standing patents for invention with printing machines in this country. And uh, I don't know, everything old is new again in our shop. And I think that's the, the love of it, I, I yeah. would say. Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll take your word for all of that. Yeah, obviously, you, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know I don't. Um, but I, well, another way to think about it, if, I, if, if in fact it's not uh, simply a fetish, um, which I don't mean to say, I don't sure, mean that all to, to be a, a, a knock. Um, Remember, I did say it was a gateway drug. Right, so. you no, know, I, yeah, I understand. Oh, true, there's okay. a, there's so close is maybe, maybe the, like, you know, your, your uh, Adobe InDesign and your Quark Expresses and these kinds of things have, have allowed, have, have offered people the opportunity to then see where does this come from, right? Right. And now you know, and books pre printed now often. You know, I buy a novel and in the back. It'll say this was set in this typeface, and that typeface came from 1780 whatever, and was designed originally. It's been modernized a bit. I mean, these kinds of things I think are, are relatively new. Uh, in an age when people have access to so many typefaces, for example, on their computers, mm -hmm. and and often employ them. I mean, I know my students think about typeface because in, I always have to tell them that they're not allowed to turn in papers in Courier um, because it adds like, like maybe a quarter page per page. Like, you know, if, you, if it's in Times New Roman and you j bump it to Courier, it like almost doubles in length, uh, the paper. So they do think about it. I don't think they think about it much beyond that, but people do have the opportunity to think about it. Maybe that draws some people into the kind of the more historical methods of, sure. of printing. I think what has, what has really happened in the digital age, if you notice this with books published in the last five, 10 years, they do have in the back the colophon, uh, everything from what paper it was printed on. There's an awareness now to this. And you look at books printed, maybe um, we, we had this discussion here about a month ago with some design students from Art Institute. I pulled some recent publications and there's you know, almost a dissertation or a novel in the back on the typeface, why it was selected, the paper, everything. Mm -hmm make it reading easy on the eyes and et cetera. And then you, you jump back 15, 20 years ago, you go to the back of the book, there's nothing. So there's been a great interest in, in people 
want to know about type, and it's obviously, as I say jokingly, it's the internet machine that has opened people up to this. And I think, um, you know, everyone's a writer now with a computer, um, if you think about it. And ev everybody and anybody can blog. It's, it's, it's opened up an amazing amount of doors. But um, still, like you said, with your students, there are, they're infatuated with what's in the back of the book. And I think that's great because there was a gap for some time that you look at, go, go home tonight and look at books, pull books out, printed in the 80s into the early 90s. You will not see a colophon or even the, the paper that was selected. And now there's an interest, and which is good. And I wish I, I, I didn't even think to bring it with me. I, um, you know, books have changed a lot as a result of the internet. And like, the, the way these things come together, uh, print technology, of the sort you do, but then the kind of the the, uh, the digital technologies. Um, a writer, uh, Mark Danieleski's book, uh, House of Leaves from 2000. It's this in it's this like amazingly baroque uh, typesetting challenge. Like it's it's there are, there's one chapter, chapter nine, the labyrinth. It's called, and it's um, it is a series. It starts with a footnote, and it keeps going. Each footnote has a footnote, and it, the foot you have to flip around the pages, and you have to read them upside down and in mirrors. It's it's insanely complicated. Um, and it's such a, it was such a typesetting challenge because it wasn't done on a computer, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Even though it looks like there's no way they did this on an actual, you know, like actual typesetting, but he actually had to go in for Random House and do the typesetting himself because they said, we're not touching this. And, they, and he didn't want to do it on a computer. He wanted to do it kind of more traditionally, even though the book makes constant allusions to digital technology, including the fact that every time the word house appears, it appears in the internet blue of the hyperlink. Um, and... Um, the book is itself about books. I mean, it's about a house that's bigger on the inside than on the outside, which is the kind of the, the way of talking. Books are bigger on the inside, right, in, in terms of their ideas than on the outside. So um, it's, it's amazing to me the way these kind of two worlds come together uh, sometimes. Uh, one, what, what would have seemed like very anachronistic 30 years ago, it's like, oh, you letter pressing, this kind of stuff. It, I think exactly. it, now it's, it's like, I think it's come back because it is because it's important historically, but also it really offers a very different way of doing yeah. things, as you that suggested. I for the first time maybe ever in civilization, we've really been there's been an awakening with the internet machine on typography, and and that when you look at the with not giving it away on who is Marcellus Wallace, if you just you look at the typography, the typography, as Brian said earlier, communicates in the correct vernacular and the tone exactly what is being said. And it's, there's, it's, it's beautiful. I'm, I mean, there, there's vulgar language, but hey. Um, and the American Psycho scene is brilliant for the way that all the business cards are basically exactly, exactly the, the same. same. Because this is the culture of the 1980s. The, 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 the suits are all the same. The haircuts are all the same. And yet they're like, oh, this is eggshell, and this is off-white, or something. And they're like, oh, I should have gotten eggshell, damn it. You know, and, and, they're sitting, and Patrick Bateman, the titular character, yeah. it's really upset that like th that font is so perfect, and mine is so bad. And, but then you look at them next to each other, and the joke is that they're exactly, exactly the, the same, same business card. But yeah, no, I, I could not agree more with you. And, it's, uh, and the, I think the interesting thing is when you see it, w at least what's been gratifying for myself, is we have a group of young design students um, that have you know, graduated or finishing design school, and they're rattling off typefaces. And, and I'm the first to admit that I, you could put the three same typefaces in front of me. I need about a minute or two to look at them. I can't readily identify them as uh, Brian, Tom, or Ray could uh, that are here tonight. And what's interesting is these guys are so well-educated in this day and age many of these designers on their typefaces, they can sit and you can put anything in front of them and they can identify. And so maybe in a sense with this internet machine, as I call it, I never call it the internet, I always call it the internet machine, and because uh, it is a machine, um, that this is exposing people and with, um, with um, digital printing, one of the big things that what's, what's facing offset printing in this country right now, um, there has been some new technology for digital printing that's going to have a larger format. A lot of the offset printers in this country are really worried, is print dead now? Um, because with the advent of a digital press, those of you are familiar with digital printing, um, much of the work that I've distributed here tonight, if it's not all offset, 
if it's not all letter press, there's some offset printing involved in it. And what has happened with the, the internet is what's called on-demand printing. And what they're really, really worried about affecting books right now, um, most of the American illustrators um, are losing their jobs because much of the illustrating work is being sent to India and China. Um, and I had a long conversation today with, a, with a, an amazing designer that just illustrated a book uh, for Stephen King that his image, his look, his work is now going to be sent to a foreign country. And with, with digital printing, what we're, this is, um, got to remember, printing is one of the top five industries in the United States. And remember, that hangs up there with oil and other manufacturing. That's how important printing, well, I mean printing books, um, the wrapper here, um, the packaging for my watch or what have you, that um, with the advent of this of digital printing, people are not stockpiling like the pocket folders that I've passed around or even this, this uh, portfolio piece that we did for the financial planner. Um, and what you've got to wonder is, what's going to happen to one of the top five industries within this country in the next five to seven years? And, uh, but they say that every. Oh, I know. It's you know it was it was the internet first, and now sure. it's the Kindle, um, and then and next it'll be something else, and you know it'll be smart paper or something. And I, it, We're talking I don't about know. Smart paper. I have to interrupt you. They're actually working on a paper right now. And imagine this: if you design a brochure for a company that cuts grass, or they're a, they're a sod company, or they do um, um, they monitor. Uh, properties like here at CU, that you open the brochure and you smell fresh cut grass. They're putting droplets in the paper. So, I mean, what 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 evokes more of a of a, um, um, or evokes or conjures something up more of a human being than fresh cut grass? That's something every one of us can identify with. Signify spring. There's so many things that 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 evokes. And with some of the paper, they do have, I watched my little boy's books, the little scratch and sniff books. Um, they're, they're experimenting with different things within paper. Um, if, you're a, if you're a janitorial company, and I'm not a big fan of pine saw, but I'll be honest, every now and then it does smell great when you walk in a room. Um, you, have a, you hand out a brochure, and you open up the brochure, and it smells like pine saw, and you're a cleaning company. Um, or maybe there's something with education that um, maybe there's, you open something up, a presentation to, uh, to go to a, a college, and you, there's a certain, it smells like pines, so you figure, ah, I'm going to go to CU in, um, in Boulder, Colorado. It smells I mean, like I'm something else at CU. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On that wonderful note, we've moved from touch to smell, okay. and uh, please join us for other delightful food and smell <laughs> reception and continue the conversation. Join me in thanking our speakers again. Thank you.